Hello everyone, this is Jonathan here. I wanted to come in with a cold open to let you know that there is a slight echo sometimes on the recording for this week. We're not really sure why that happened, whether it was one of our locations, or if some button was clicked wrong, or if someone's microphone was getting some feedback, but it does not disrupt your ability to hear what we're talking about, and just wanted to let you know that we have made note of that, and we'll work on fixing that in the future. Thanks, and let's get started. Hello and welcome to Rusty Water Towers, the podcast in search of faith and hope in rural life and ministry. I'm your host, Jonathan Lamaster Smith, or as folks often call me, Dr. J. Each episode of the podcast, I talk with a guest about their experience in rural life and ministry as we search stories, examples, and images of creative faith and hope that I believe are latent in rural communities. My guest today is Britt Terry. Britt is an English professor at the University of South Carolina. She funded her academic career with scholarship pri- scholarships and prizes from her days showing dairy cattle in 4-H. Britt lives with her husband, Jonathan Searcy, also an English professor, and her daughter, Catherine, in a book-filled house. Britt attends Pisgah Methodist Church, founded in 1791 by her ancestor, Thomas Terry. She has also appeared on Jeopardy. We start each week off with a country music recommendation about rural life and faith. And this week, we're diving into Brooks and Dunn's Neon Moon. This song begins, when the sun goes down on my side of town, that lonesome feeling comes to my door, and the whole world turns blue. There's a rundown bar across the railroad tracks. I go, I got a table for two way in the back, where I sit alone and think of losing you. This song is likely a breakup song or maybe a divorce song, or a song about lost love, but it's not a song about giving up. It feels more about a song about finding, about, about finding place underneath that neon moon. The song goes on to offer people a place to gather and grieve. It doesn't offer resolution. It doesn't offer a happy ending. It offers instead a space to come and be together. In the end, sometimes we just need those spaces. We don't need fixing. We don't need our problem solved. We just need a space to come and grieve, to remember, and to be together. This could, if it goes on too long, become a space of melancholy or hauntedness. But the benefit of a community is that it can, if it is functioning well, allow for grief, support, and boundaries. Of course, many communities do not exist in this way, but my hope is that people dealing with loss and pain of any kind can find a community in a rural space, whether it be a church or a bar or a backyard, that allows them to, as the song says, come and watch your broken dreams dance in and out of the beams of a neon moon. Oh, watch your broken dreams dance in and out of the beams of a neon moon. As always, I'll add this to our Rusty Water Towers playlist on Spotify. All right, now let's get to know our guest. So welcome, Britt. What's been your experience of this song? So it's like on the tail end of my country music knowledge. Mm -hmm. I grew up with like 80s and 90s country in the background of like my dad's radio. And I definitely had uh, Garth Brooks's No Fences album. Mm -hmm. And so Neon Moon was on the radio quite a bit back in the day and I yeah I like this one. okay and I I feel like it's I always wonder like is it the same place just later after the club from Boot Scoot and Boogie like is it the same bar Ooh, I hope it is I hope it's a space where people can live out whatever their life is at the moment yeah I mean like on the edge of town but this is like maybe a Tuesday night instead of a Saturday night oh yeah yeah they got together on a Saturday night and broke up by Tuesday? Maybe two Tuesdays. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I like that the the neon light is like a moon. So it's that like combination of this like man-made sort of extravagant light. But then it's got this infusion of rurality. Like it's this deserted kind of bar. And mm-hmm. like you associate, well, I associate moons with... Um, I don't know, like a kind of loneliness or something. Um, and then it reminds me of one of my favorite poems that begins with talking about a moon. So like 
I kind of I kind of pick up on that from this song. Nice, nice. What was the name of the poem? We'll put it in the show notes. It's called Frost at Midnight by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Frosted Midnight by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Mm -hmm. Nice. We'll put that in the show notes if we can find a link to it. Cool. All right, great. So now let's get to know you a little bit. Uh, what's your experience of rural life and rural and rural ministry? I grew up on the same kind of like piece of land as like my ancestors did. And so we all kind of went to the same church. Mm -hmm. It's a good United Methodist. And so that, I guess, was like part of the land track that our original ancestor owned. Mm -hmm. um, and then that church in I, early 1800s was visited by Francis Asbury. So like awesome. that sort of like vein or root ran deep in my life. I feel like I didn't understand how rural we were um, until I went to college probably. And even it, like, I probably should have known it before, but I didn't. Um, and I, I will say like in preparing to talk with you, I have been like confusing Southerness with rurality, if that makes sense. Oh, that's, that's very true. That, that can easily happen. You can, your regionalism and your rurality can be uh, blended together. Yeah. And it's not the same thing, obviously. Um, so I've been having to like untangle those two ideas, but yeah, we grew up on a road that doesn't have like a line painted down it. And ah, yeah. initially like our address was like route one. We didn't have a house number. Um, even now the only utility that's available to us is power. We had to like uh -huh. really sort of rally to get water. Um, so to get on county water or city water. Yes. You had to rally for that. Yes. Yes. Because um, probably in the uh, early 90s, we had our, we, we have a well, my parents mm -hmm. did, and had the water tested for some reason. And there was an, an inordinate amount of uranium in it. Oh, oh. Yeah. It's like a Aaron Brockovich situation. Yes. And so my mom was one of the vocal people like, fussing at the county to get the water down the road yes because you don't need people with radiation poisoning yeah it's a bad look yeah and so um went to college and then was away from where i grew up for probably 25 years and maybe three or four years ago we moved back to the area and now like i literally can look out my window and see my childhood home my aunt my uncle's house like my parents have, yeah that that's that's a wonderful thing to get the chance to come back and still be able to have your career yeah yeah i'm super fortunate to mm -hmm. do that so that those are in like the church i grew up in like and now attend again like mm -hmm. i'm related to most of the people there um but then the people i'm not actually related to i've like have known me all my life so that's a little bit of a strange experience to be able to interact with people who were my Sunday school teachers or like my parents' friends who are now my friends, or I can mm -hmm. talk to as an adult instead of as a kid. Mm -hmm. Do you have some of those who you are still 12 years old to? I would think a vast percentage of them I am still 12 years old to, <laughs> even though like I have my own child and a husband and a PhD yes. and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sometimes when I've run into place, run into like childhood, they'll ask me questions, or I'll, I'll they'll talk, and you know, it's still they get remember you as the you know the eight year old or the twelve year old who sat in the back of the sanctuary and colored. And if I were not the pastor, I may still be sitting in the back of the sanctuary and coloring. Yeah. But <laughs> it's that reality of it. Uh, of the, they have those memories of you, just like you have the memories of them twenty years ago. Right. <laughs> um, and like. Last week we had our like annual fall festival, which used to be called a Halloween carnival, but that's the only thing that's changed is like the name of it. We still have like the go fish game. Oh, we the have, go fish like, game. Yeah. And like the beanbag toss and we don't bob for apples anymore. It's gross. But we have a cakewalk. Like that is like the 
the crowning game. And then this one woman who's 91, her cake is like the prize and people will like fight over it, sort of. Oh, yeah, that's that's several churches I know of. and Or that or a cake auction where there's cakes that people have already bought before you get there. Yeah. It's it's so, yeah, just people love their cakes in these rural spaces. Uh, yeah, I, I, what, what made them change the name from Halloween to Harvest Festival or Autumn Festival or whatever you're calling it? I don't think I was on deck for when that change happened, but I don't I don't remember. I mean, we used to... We used to have a haunted house at it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I grew up with. I grew up with a haunted house or a haunted cemetery, and it was a lot of fun. The church I left before I uh, before I came to teach, and now I'm back in back in ministry. Was um, it had I had worked with it to create a haunted basement of the church for people to go through. That's totally what we had. I mean, and it was it was scary. <laughs> it was like this subterranean space filled with spiders and who knows what down there you know uh we used to have a hay ride too and like it would go grind through the woods and then like it would kind of like the tractor would break down and then some scary people would come out of the woods and Ooh, i love that it was so fun yeah do they yeah. still do that since you said nothing no else? because i don't know some folks were like worried that we would get sued if something terrible oh. happened and so they sort of backed off some of that stuff it's some of the insurance issues plus the, when the 90s came around the trunk or treat craze and the fall yep. festival craze because we didn't want to confuse people with hauntedness even though halloween traces itself back to all saints day so right. and so it's obviously a time for churches to get together and celebrate life and this was in my sermon yesterday, so I did the research about Halloween as becoming the space for the the Christmas part that Christmas parties, Halloween type <laughs> parties with bobbing for apples and the fishing game and trick and trick or treating about taking joy out into the community and renewing the community for another year. And yeah, and I think that's interesting too because like as a kid, I never, I guess this is also bizarre. I really didn't run into this until I got into my PhD program and knew more people from different faith traditions that Halloween was supposed to be this like demon, like quasi demonic thing. I was like, are you kidding? It's for candy guys. It's for fun and candy and for people to get together and be silly. And be like a little bit scared. And then, you know, yeah. that like your uncle busting out of the woods. Yeah. Which could happen any day anyway. Uh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. It's always, it's always interesting to me why somebody somewhere decided it was demonic because we wore witches hats and made believe. Um, one of my favorite philosophers actually writes about it in his essay on hunger of an ox and how Halloween is actually a chance for us to try on new identities and to experience world with outside of the, uh, the ways we're expected to behave. And maybe that's an issue that some churches had because they make their money off expecting people to behave a certain way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, that makes me think of like Carnival. And, um, oh, yeah. It's all attached together. Yeah. And I always thought that stuff was fun. And so that, that to me, I think pushes against a rural stereotype that like you're so isolated and you're backward and you don't understand the big ideas when, um, for instance, this idea of like Halloween and its traditions and connected to All Saints Day uh -huh. is like more wise and then the like sort of i want to say like bourgeois ideas that come through like oh this is demonic and satan's big party day or something like never occurred to us yep. until it's introduced from a more mainstream outside yeah an external sort of suburban atmosphere brought yeah. it in and we were all just like okay <laughs> yeah and and my and I see that the the movement of trying to bring some of that back, of uh, of that partying like you've still got the fall festival you've still got that but like just pulling it back into saying let's find the real tradition that was there before we got you know sort of usurped by some sort of moralist ideals that were not our morals and our understanding of things exactly yeah. yes it's a, it's a reality I also learned when I put it in my church newsletter there's also Christmas boogering have you heard of that. I have not. It's basically trick or treating, but at Christmas time, and you go get Christmas treats from people. I like that idea. 
Uh, yeah, you should you should totally see if you can bring that back in your community, but not tell anyone you're doing it. You're just wandering around dressed in a Halloween costume <laughs> on like December 23rd. Yes. <laughs> They're like, Britt, is that you? What are you doing? No, I can <laughs> do that. You've been working yeah. too much. Silly Adam Sandler routine. They're like, <laughs> I'm crazy springhead. Now give me some candy. <laughs> exactly. Well, Thank you for sharing a little bit about your your life and where you are. And we're going to take a short break and we'll get back and we'll come back and you can share some stories with us. Okay. Hi there, Jonathan here, and I'm recording this ad to tell you about a resource from the Hinton Rural Life Center. My wife, Shannon, and I have partnered with Hinton to create the Theotokos Connections Confirmation Curriculum for small rural churches. We designed this curriculum with rural youth programs in mind, where you really want to connect their teenagers with the culture, heritage, and place on top of the faith you're trying to instill through the confirmation program. There are six sessions that focus on topics like connecting to self, God, history, church, place, and creation. Each unit has either a Bible story, like the story of Mary or the story of Samuel, or a historical figure like Richard Allen or Harriet Tubman, to engage with as part of the experience. But this experience is not just a sit and listen and do a paperwork kind of confirmation. It's an active and connective confirmation program. You might be headed to a museum, helping prepare for a church spaghetti supper, learning new prayer practices, assisting in worship, or volunteering at the local mission agency. It is designed with rural culture and rural life in mind. You can do this in six weeks, six months, and you can do them in most any order or form you want to engage And I'll tell you, I'm pretty sure it's not just youth programs using this curriculum. I've seen other people get it for their college ministries, as well as perhaps using it as adult confirmation or adult refresher on Methodist and rural culture and life. And you know, if you have other trusted confirmation curriculum you want to pair it with, go ahead. This is a very customizable program. So if you want to bring other lessons from a different program you've used or things you've written yourself, feel free to blend them in. This is also a very affordable program and you pay per student, not for a lump sum curriculum that you may not use all the pieces of, or you may not use but once every two or three years. And this is designed to make it affordable and accessible for you. And it pairs well with Hinton's Theotokos confirmation retreats that happen in the spring. For more information on the curriculum or to place an order, check out hintoncenter.org slash theotokos or hintontheotokos.org for more information. Thanks. Uh, so now, Britt, I ask all of my guests for a story, an experience, or an example of how you see Faith at Hope continuing to work in rural life. So I'm going to encourage you to tell any stories or experiences you've had. Yeah, so um, I'll kind of set the stage first about our church, which I've talked about before. Um, it's really small like the physical space is small. Mm -hmm. It used to be in the middle of nowhere, but now um, with like more people moving into the area, it's a little bit um, more anchored or visible, let's say. And, but when I was a kid, I always thought the hymn church in the wildwood, like Mm -hmm. I literally thought that was a church um, because it was just kind of like among these trees and it's a little, it it is a brick building, but it's a little brown church. Mm -hmm. Um, So I remember just growing up having the same kind of like routine with Sundays. Um, And then after I moved away, I went to some like bigger churches, which is where I met Karen. And Kathleen Kilborn too. Mm. Um, and then I attended a really big church in Columbia and then in Somerville, South Carolina. So like returning back to Fisgut was a little bit disorienting um, at first. But um, let me, this is a classic Southern style storytelling. Let me get back to, <laughs> I was gonna say, so like grew up in a small church We were always in charge with another church because we were so small. We couldn't pay a full-time preacher. Mm -hmm. And I, um, yeah, just like remember like participating in things and 
being able to sing in the choir, even though I was like nine and couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. So when it came time for me to interview for my first academic job, it was at a Christian school of the Baptist persuasion. And I had to tell my salvation story. And I, I was like, uh, I grew up in church all the time. Like, it was not dramatic. It was like the most boring, yes. flat thing. It's the same for me. And people ask, I'm like, well, I just kind of grew up with this. And my, you know, my call to ministry story is a little more interesting. But like my salvation story is I was raised in the church and then I went through confirmation. Exactly. And I'm like, Jesus is the son of God. Like, I can like tell you those things because I believe those things. But it wasn't like I was out partying and not like there's no yeah conversion that's dramatic so i had to like come up with a story to tell the president of this university because he got the final say so i sort of was like how can i baptist up this story <laughs> and what i ended up telling him was um like i said what i've just told you and then I was like, I got to connect it to something more specific. So I talked about how when we were in high school, I guess it was during like Bible school or something, we had a speaker come who worked for Heifer Project International. And um, instead of, well, maybe in addition to giving money to Heifer Project, our 4-H club raised a calf that we took wow. to somewhere in rural Kentucky and gave to a family. So I was telling the, the president of this university this story, like we were able to raise this cow and um, I totally cheated and borrowed some words from John Wesley. And I was like, and my heart was strangely warmed. And I knew that, you know, Jesus was real or something like that. And, I thought to myself later, I got the job, so I guess I did okay. Yeah. Um, that the go-to for me was like some story about a cow. <laughs> <laughs> that tends not to be the best thing in the Bible, though. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked for you. It did. And it, so that, like these kind of denominational differences that I was truly ignorant of like I don't understand how I got that far in life before like this was like I was in my 30s I guess in this job and I thought oh boy where have I been yeah I mean it, and it's uh, that asking the salvation story they probably were just asking for an understanding of your faith mm -hmm. but at, at the end you hear this sort of language and you we all run to a certain understanding of what a salvation story is or right. assume based on their denomination not on our tradition. Yeah. And I, like I said, it was a Baptist school. So like I knew they had like a, a different understanding of it. I'm like, do I need to match this up? Or like, this is going to be a really short story. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, hey, if it worked and you got a position. Yeah. Yeah. So that. that he trick, understood enough to where he was willing to hire you that you knew who right. Jesus was. So right. That was. Yes. And, and we had heard like horror stories of people who didn't quite answer the question properly. So ah. got, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Good to yeah. know. As you keep going, I mean, you have any other stories or experiences you've got in terms of rural life, faith, ministry? Sure. I, like I said, I've attended, um, after going to college, like different churches of different sizes. And I would mm -hmm. say like, Two of them were definitely suburban. One was urban, like downtown Columbia, right off Main Ooh. Street. Yeah, Washington Street, United Methodist, which has a good Halloween story. But anywho. Uh. <laughs> so for those of you listening, we're recording on Halloween. I don't know when this one will be posted, but <laughs> that's why, that's why we're, we've, we've talked about Halloween off, off and on already. I went to these like suburban, urban yeah. churches. And so... I could be kind of invisible. Yes. And after, like, in a rural church, I think that is very difficult to do because everybody needs to be doing something. Mm -hmm. Because if you, you aren't, then something's not going to get done. Growing up, we always 
took up money for things like Epworth's Children's Home and things like that. Our, and Pisgah had always had like 100% of their apportionments paid yeah, yeah. and things like that. So, and we always did Super Bowl Sunday and all the churches I attended did that where they raised money for local soup kitchens. Mm -hmm. Washington Street actually had a soup kitchen in its basement. But um, we're at this really big church in Somerville and they had the youth like picking up money after service. And the next Sunday they were like, oh, we collected $500 or something. And this is in a church of, there are probably 900 people in the books, but there were 200 people in like the service. So coming back to Pisgah, we did, I guess it was in 2019, pre-COVID, we did another like Super Bowl Sunday thing. Our teeny tiny church collected like almost a thousand dollars. Wow. And like most of the people that attend there are, <laughs> a lot of them are retired these days. Yes. But they're like blue collar workers. So fixed income likely or minimum pension retirement funds. Yes. Or if they're still work again, like some of them did like really skilled trades and things like that. So they made decent money, but certainly not corporate executive level. Stuff. Downtown church type money. Yeah. Right. And they're like taking up all this money. And then that had, that was a compliment to a ministry that they had been doing and still do like a backpack ministry for oh, wow. yeah. kids who are food insecure. Mm -hmm. They had my nieces and my daughter. They were packing the backpacks on Sunday afternoon before they went to like youth group. Oh, yeah. So, yes. so those of you who are listening and don't know what a backpack program is, it is a program in which uh, often local churches and community agencies will partner with local schools to provide weekend food for kids who may be food insecure. And they offer usually packed things that are healthy with a mix of fun stuff too, and are easy to open. And you may not that you don't often need a microwave for, or you minimum you need the maximum you need is a microwave. So cans of ravioli and little cups of soup and fruit cups and anything that's easy open uh, to go with that. Mm -hmm. We did that for I mean I've been doing it for probably ten years, and it's totally under the radar. I don't know that if you ask anybody at the local. Um, elementary school who we were or are nobody but the school counselors could tell you that but like mm -hmm. this church and I think in a lot of rural communities this is true like it's indicative of how in touch with the community they are and like for Pisgah it's like embedded in the community so they know these people or they know people like this and they're willing to give money and time and like labor to make these programs work and that was just striking to me that our like this tiny church gave more than the big old church mm -hmm. and then are doing this thing that um is really hands-on to help people and i think other folks do similar things. We've got a couple of people who go to local elementary schools, mm -hmm. read to kids or do the mentor thing where they like have lunch with a student once a week or mm -hmm. just ways that they are connected beyond the walls of the church. And I think that's kind of remarkable. It, it does get, I can imagine taxing because even I'm like the Sunday school teacher for my own kid. Um, and so it's like, it's a reality. Hey. When, you're, when you're in a church, you may be the Sunday school teacher. Yeah. And that's not, that is not where my gifts lie. I would say I teach, but I don't teach little kids. <laughs> yeah. It's a, you have to know where your gifts are. So you may, you may transition out of that one day. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and um, so when she's, like, a, when she's it, a te youth, then you'll be the youth Sunday school teacher. It, probably, but that <laughs> might be a little bit easier. However, you know, like she doesn't. She kind of tunes me out because you know I'm her mom. That happens. Yeah, so that that makes it a little bit more challenging. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I think that that is kind of an amazing thing about rural churches, and it's certainly a spot of hope um, when. People who don't have a lot are willing to give and share what they do have 
to make everybody else around them more comfortable or sustainable, like to be able to like live a real life. Yes. Yeah. To, to make the church sustainable, we all have to be part of the church. We can't, we're not just consumers of church. Right. And I think at other spaces, and that's not to say that the people who do that are, you know, terrible people or something, but that you, you feel it more in a smaller church, I think. Because you're seeing it more. I think you probably, in that, in that church that you attended that had uh, didn't collect as much money, that sort of reality of uh, you probably, there are probably people there who are working as much as the other people. You oh, should totally. see it. Uh, yeah. That are there, that are the chair of something, or the person who's taught Sunday school for 25 years, or the person who makes sure that the altar cloths are the right color and clean, and those sort of things. Yeah, and like somebody, so at that church, there were 40 people in our Sunday school class. Mm-hmm. It's like... I grew up in a church of 40 people, period. Yes. I, I taught uh, a Sunday school class that was f- sometimes had 50 people. I'm like, y'all are a small church. Right. <laughs> and, you know, a couple of people in that Sunday school class were chairs of things that, um, you know, like something that had a million dollar budget for a project they were building or funding. Wow. Yeah. And then like, say it like Washington Street, a historic property um, all the preservation stuff they would have to do there to like make sure the organ sounds good and doesn't like get condensation from like the stone walls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I know that work was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I, I was on staff at that church too. So like I could see some of that, but yeah, it's different. It is different. It is different. And whereas like, you probably grew up in a church like I did, where we may have had an electric organ or a clavinova. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they could just and press the not, buttons and it would change the sound of the. Right. Uh, and uh, like nobody really knew how to play it. So pretty yeah. much just a piano. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like two people could play the piano. Mm-hmm. So both of them were like out of town on the same day. I was like, okay, we got to. Acapella, this. And yes. The, the advent easy. of uh, Spotify and Bluetooth speakers has made life easier for some churches. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, thank, thank you for that. I mean, that's such a reality in so many of our rural churches is that we see that it is really a community that bands together to accomplish the goals. Mm-hmm. And that celebra- and, and also that celebration of we are still paying our apportionments uh, uh, fully. We are still contributing to the missional network or to the local food banks on a regular basis. We are, we are offering programs to the church and the community that are vital. And oftentimes rural churches need to be reminded that what they are doing is so vital to their communities, even if it doesn't feel like they're reaching the same people that X church that has 5,000 people in worship in it are reaching because in the end, in a rural area, you're not meeting 5,000 people anyway. It's it's that reality of it, that your ministry matters no matter what it looks like and how big or small it is, as long as it's trying to do the things that we're supposed to be doing according to Scripture. Right, exactly. <laughs> that reminded me, too, that they have the um, their site for one of the release time ministry things where, like— That's right. You're in South Carolina, and they have release time. Yeah, the middle school is right up the road. They have three, like a sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade class. And there may be five kids in each of those classes, but mm-hmm. they've also partnered with some local churches mm-hmm. that have different teachers for the classes. And they have really good snacks. And Snacks do help in your Methodist. So, I mean, that's the, the important part of having the food there. And for exactly. those of you listening, release time is some states offer a situation where schools can allow for time off, a study hall sort of situation where students can attend religious courses uh, that mm-hmm. either match their religion or are a different religion, depending upon the area, what they're interested in. Yeah. So I just have to make sure I define words for people on here because I know that some people have no sure. idea what we're talking about. Yeah. I've also had to define things like liver mush and persimmon pudding. I've never had a persimmon. You've never had them? No. Well, you, I mean, they come in cans in the grocery store too, but it's more fun to wander around outside and find them. Yeah. I mean, we have a tree, but my dad freaked me out about it because he's like, these are the most bitter thing or like. Well, if power. you eat them green, they are. But if you eat them right around the frost, either just before or just after, it is like a sweeter treat because the tannins shift. Yeah. And then I think we have some kind of critter out there or i know we do like a possum or like 
Oh yeah, everybody <laughs> loves those. It's like fig trees. Everybody, every everything will get to the fig trees before you do. Yeah. So it's that reality. Back, sorry, back just from re- to release time. You your your church is a site for release time. It is. Yeah. So that's another like way that they're connecting with the community. It's connected to the local middle school, which I think all middle schools need as much help as they can. And that that would be the truest statement. Yeah, because I mean, I think everybody thinks about elementary schools and volunteering there and I think middle schools definitely need community connection and high schools I think get it through sports and things like that what is that sort of left behind middle a middle child situation where the elementary school kids get all the support on the front end the high school kids like we're going to support the sports and the academics because they're getting ready to go off to college or to go to work so we make sure they're ready for it and middle schoolers just like gross no yeah (laughs) <laughs> even though middle schoolers are great if you just know how to talk to them exactly yeah so any other thoughts or stories that you have to share with us i will say too that my experience in a rural church has been i think they're more willing to like depart from maybe procedure mm-hmm. or something like that like i remember as a young person being able to kind of do anything we wanted to, as long as we, you know, were in bounds with scripture and stuff like that. So like, say youth Sunday, you want to, pre- like, I was like, can I preach? Sure. What are you going to talk about? I'm like, uh, probably Jesus, but like, I, I'm not sure. And it was sort of like, okay, well, as long as you like have some scripture to go along with what you're going to talk about, keep it to X number of minutes and then kind of have at it. There was no, oh, well, I'm not sure if you're going to say the right thing or we've never done it this way. And now, don't get me wrong. There are some traditions, certainly in Pisgah, at Pisgah, that are embedded mm-hmm. and they ain't moving. But there is also this kind of free space and that yeah. goes with like, you know, like, hey, let's have an oyster rose tomorrow, or let's let's build this prayer garden since we've got this donated money. Let's, yes. How can we reach the community? And I think that those kind of conversations got like the release time site, got people connected with the backpack ministry, like fixing meals for local teachers, things like that. Mm-hmm. That a rural church because it doesn't have these 15 committees that have to meet has, has this free space. Mm -hmm. And since most everybody lives within like a two mile radius of the church, they have a good sense of what the community needs and what neighbors need help or something like that and ways to connect them in not just in a service in helping somebody, but like to have fun um, and how that links up with the small, with the rural church. That is so important. I mean, this, that we have the space to do that, that work of just, uh, it's, it makes me so happy. It's, it's that so, it's just sort of naturally occurring that you have the opportunity for growth and change. And, you know, like you said, there's going to be some things that we do not change. <laughs> at least for this generation. Sure. And you know that every generation it's going to have the things that do not change because we do that thing. And usually it's a fairly innocuous thing, unless mm-hmm. you can like point out that it's really causing harm. Why not really? Right. Uh, and so, but then around those sort of pillars, I we think of those as those standard things that happen every year uh, without fail. You can, you can plant new things that'll grow up and you can test out the waters Mm-hmm. And say, oh, well, we need this for a season. And it's going to, and, but we have this supportive thing in the middle. Like worship's always going to happen. We're not oh. in a situation. I've seen other churches that are fairly new church starts that'll be like, we're going to not have church on Sunday morning anymore. We're going to do it on Wednesday nights. And, but like in our older churches, like you and I, like I'm serving churches that are early 1800s, you know, church is on Sunday morning and we are not going to change it unless there is fire, flood, or snow. Right. Or, or plague and and that sort of uh, reality of that. But you want to start, you want to add something, another ministry in? Let's do it. Tuesday nights are open. We're going to have Bible study every Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Done. 
Yeah. And I think it's delightful. And yeah, when you were mentioning like Sunday service, like our, we always meet at like 930. Mm -hmm. And I think it, how we met a little bit earlier at one point, it was like a big deal to change it. And our church is always first on the charge. And I remember my, my granddad went to church and he would go to Pisgah. I mean, obviously it was closer, but the other reason was like, the preacher has to be finished by a certain time so he can get to the other church. And then my pa could like go home and have his dinner mm -hmm. and not exactly. be late for that. Oh, I was, my wife and I often will joke, we would actually prefer churches that have earlier services so you can like go out to brunch on a Sunday, go hiking, exactly. beat yeah. the crowds places. And <laughs> when I went to college, it was the opposite. I was like, sweet. It doesn't start until 11 o'clock. This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and particularly after our daughter was born, it was like, all right, 830 service, I am there. Exactly. Because I've already been up for two hours. It's why those not? lifestyle changes. That's why That's why. So we need to offer different times for different people. Yeah. But like, Pisgah is not changing. They're, they're, uh, no, if they're, they're, if they're still on a charge, then it yeah. probably won't change. My two churches yeah. are on a charge and they work well together. So Britt, thanks so much for sharing all these great stories and experiences with us. Now I ask each of my guests to uh, offer a piece of media, music, book, video game. I don't care. Whatever you've got to share that's giving you hope for rural life today. So what did you bring for us? So I'm going to make a recommendation. Um, my friend Jeremy B. Jones, mm -hmm. who is at Western Carolina, and he's amazing. His book is called Bear Wallow, and it's about Bear Wallow Mountain. Okay. Um, Bear Wallow and his, Mountain. Mm -hmm, and his family's connection to that space. So it's, um, I guess you would say it's a memoir. Um, but it's also got like history infused in it. Um, and then information about Jeremy's teaching and his experience in Honduras. And then also going back to that town. Um, another one of Jeremy's pieces, which I adore, is called Note, Notes on a Mountain Man. Notes on uh, a Mountain Man. Yeah. It's about Ernest T. Bass, the character from Andy Griffith. Nice. And it is in a volume called Appalachian Reckoning. It is a response to J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy mm -hmm. that certainly complicates Vance's narrative. Um, and Jeremy's is amazing because mm -hmm. Ernest T. Bass is like a huge... Like, I wouldn't go so far as a call him, but, well, maybe he is a top 10 TV character for me. Nice. And Jeremy, like, plays with that trope. Um, and, yeah, he's he's amazing. Mm -hmm. The other thing, and this is, like, totally, <laughs> um, it's, it, it may be, like, a, a big-time left turn, but when I was listening to Neon Moon. Yes. And also looking at the difference between being rural and southern and the term country kept popping in my head yes and it leads me directly to a song on outcast album equimini the song is called west savannah west Va west havana savannah west savannah okay like yes. georgia okay yeah yeah and it's like a narrative there like upbringing and like their cre creative partnership and there's a line in there that says um people think we're country but we're just southern and that album is or like that song particularly is about like this kind of creative space mm -hmm. in the same way that like neon moon talks about a space for you to like share your heartbreak and mm -hmm. um community that song is like about how those two guys like carved out this creative space in a kind of rural neglected community mm. to be this like creative duo and like the title of the album is Equimini um 
And so it's like a combination of their um, zodiac signs. Oh. Aquarius and Gemini. It's like they're two halves of a whole. And the other thing that occurred to me too is like rap and hip hop and country music are the only places you can go now to hear like real accents. Yeah, that's it's very true. Any anything in the uh, you know the blues, rap, country, bluegrass sort of genre that their accent that is designed to be actually you can tell where they're from. Mm-hmm. Excellent, excellent. You will be the second person to recommend an Outcast song on my. Uh, well, another person coming out before you will have recommended Outcast and Nappy Roots. So it'll it'll very nice. You might have to beep beep out some stuff. <laughs> well, I won't be playing it, so it's fine. Well, I know. <laughs> People can make their own choices in terms of what they listen to. That's true. One of my courses I was building, I incorporated some music and it got an E for explicit, so I was not allowed to upload it to the the, the learning management software. So I put a link and I said, you make your own choices, but it wouldn't let me embed the video because uh. it had explicit lyrics. You're all adults. Yeah. So it's that sort of sort of reality. You make your own choices as adults. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for being here. How can my listeners reach you? Um, so you can reach me, um, my email address. I'm a little yes. old school with this. It's probably the best way to do it. Yes. So my email address is v, like Virginia, mm-hmm. dot Brit, B-R-I-T-T, dot Terry, mm-hmm. T-E-R-R-Y, at Gmail. Great, great. I will put that in the show notes. Yes. Uh, anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? I think that's all. Great, great. Well, thank you again for being with us on Rusty Water Towers. You can listen to Rusty Water Towers wherever you get podcasts. If you have questions, suggestions for guest topics, or just want to say hi, you can reach us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or you can email us at rustywatertowers at gmail.com. Special thanks to my wife, Shannon Lamaster Smith, for our theme music titled Hildebrand. I record and produce this podcast because of my hope that it lifts up the hope and faith found in rural life. Thanks for listening. I live across the railroad tracks in a little lighthouse. Must you pass if you weren't trying to find me? Many of the trees are dead, there's stumps in the ground In a great big yard, across from the fire station Oh